Thanks, Alan. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great, fantastic. Just put it in presentation mode. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, I'm really pleased on behalf of George and myself to uh, share with you the progress on our project. So I'm going to talk about the applications of our data-driven network analysis uh, tools for uh, analyzing metabolomics and epidemics data. So I would like to start by really echoing what Shankar said. And uh, so our group, we were fortunate enough to be uh, funded uh, in the first phase of the Common Fund Metabolomics Consortium. And uh, so Chuck Brandt, our fearless leader, was the PI in that project. And uh, so what I really want to do is I really want to thank uh, NIH for recognizing uh, the, uh, for funding this program and for rec recognizing the uh, important role that bioinformatics uh, and informatics in general has to play uh, in this field in uh, making possible the, make, making metabolomics uh, possible and accessible. And uh, so um, thank you very much for that. And uh, the tools that, uh, some of the tools that I'm going to uh, talk about were conceived during this first phase and really flourished in the uh, second phase of the um, funding in our DTC. So among these uh, are some data visualization and data analysis. And uh, of course, the metabol our metabolomics score made a great use of those tools as well. So uh, this is familiar to all of you, or <clears throat> some version of this or another. This is just to point out that our this is a metabolomics uh, data analysis workflow. And this is to point out that we're concerned with uh, the uh, later stage of analysis uh, right here. So um, just like you know, a couple of other groups uh, here who presented, um, we uh, sort of you know, always thinking about uh, the biological interpretation of the data and um, pathway analysis. Uh, and uh, pathway mapping with all uh, the benefits and limitations has been uh, really um, sort of, you know, the focus of many efforts in this area. And what we are trying to do, we're really trying to look beyond, beyond these biochemical pathways, right? And so uh, why do we need to do that? I think we all know that. So uh, really the goal is to be able to put the uh, high, uh, this high content data into uh, the uh, biological, uh, biochemical context and um, be able to visualize uh, data in a variety of different ways that make it uh, uh, possible to generate, in, uh, to make bio inferences and generate biological hypothesis. And so uh, I think I will echo uh, something that um, Shizao really talked about on the first day. Uh, to reiterate some of the uh, issues with traditional pathway mapping uh, for metabolomics. Uh, one uh, which we're all familiar with is the fact that uh, 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 coverage of metabolism by pathway databases is primarily centered on uh, primary is centered on primary metabolism. So this is an example of uh, lipid uh, an attempt to kind of represent lipidomics data in our uh, in-house tool Medscape, where a relatively large number of lipid species detect human plasma. Uh, like, you know, something as um, like triglycerides have basically to be collapsed to a singular node uh, because of the uh, sort of, you know, uh, because of how it is represented in pathways, similar with single myelins and uh, disoglycerols and other lipid species and so on and so forth. And uh, so uh, the other issue, obviously, issue with pathway mapping is um, the presence of uh, non-human metabolites. It can be bact uh, bacterial metabolites. It can be exogenous metabolites that uh, originate from uh, nutrition or any environmental sources, and so on and so forth. And obviously, that's the same problem that Mamicho uh, was developed to address uh, was uh, be, uh, being able to deal with unknown compounds. Okay, and so the approach that we took for uh, uh, doing this is uh, really um, as an alternative to uh, data, uh, to knowledge based uh, is a data driven approach, and uh, we chose to uh, use uh, partial correlations for doing this. 
so I'm really not going to, uh, to focus much on the um, algorithms today because uh, we talked about uh, this, um, uh, the algorithms that we developed and we're using in our tools before and this have been published. So all the details are available. I'll just uh, highlight the advantages of uh, using partial correlations. Uh, compared to, um, for example, Pearson's correlations. So, you, uh, so what we want to be able to do, we want to be able to infer uh, direct uh, relationships uh, between metabolites, as is shown here on this tool example. And uh, so uh, in order to be able to calculate a partial correlation network, you really have to uh, be able to regress each metabolite on all other metabolites in the data sets and uh, then save the residuals. That's one way to do it and calculate the correlation coefficients between the residuals. And this would allow you to uh, delineate direct and indirect associations. However, in order for this to work, um, the well-known problem is that the number of samples has to be larger than the number of metabolites. And again, as you're all aware, uh, even though metabolomics data sets are getting larger and larger, and that is evidenced by the uh, data that was presented, uh, an overview of what, meta what is in metabolomics workbench right now. However, our ability to detect more and more uh, metabolites is also evolving. So it's, uh, it has to have some computational solution. And um, so George, uh, in um, his research, have, uh, he worked on this for many, many years. So I won't do it justice, I'll just say uh, the, uh, highlight the main idea of the approach is uh, to perform a maximum likelihood estimation. And um, so uh, the technique that has been uh, uh, developed for uh, doing this type of uh, work is called graphical lasso. And uh, so this, in principle, the algorithm is fast and easy to imp uh, implement. And uh, it provides good estimates. Um, there are certain issues with the algorithm. Uh, um, uh, that I will not go into uh, right now, but uh, so the, this debiased sparse partial correlation or DSPC that has been mentioned in the context of being implemented now in uh, metabolomics workbench, um, uh, we uh, uh, implemented this also as part of our tools. So this is a Java-based standalone Java-based interface that is called Correlation Calculator. It's uh, freely available, can be downloaded. And um, so it can generate this partial relation networks that can be visualized in our tool. Uh, Medscape, which is shown here. So um, Medscape is uh, an uh, app for uh, Cytoscape. And so I checked as recently as two days ago, we had in order, something in order of 45,000 downloads. Uh, this statistics is provided by Cytoscape. Of course, uh, these are redundant. And um, uh, so we don't have, I mean, the actual number of users is probably a little bit smaller than that, but nonetheless, we're excited to have that many users of Medscape. I should mention and give credit to uh, Bill Duran, who um, is the uh, developer of this tool. And um, as um, uh, Shankar and Owen mentioned, this tool is now implemented in Metabolomics uh, Bench, this approach for building partial correlation networks. And uh, it is also available through Metabo Analyst. Um, and thank you, um, Jeff, for implementing it in Metabo Analyst. We're thrilled to have it there. So this is the same uh, lipid network uh, um, from uh, the uh, study of the um, uh, lipidomic signature progression of chronic kidney disease. Uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Penator and uh, Dr. Shinye here at the University of Michigan. And so in contrast to the previous network, this is the data-driven network uh, that we were able to uh, derive from the data. And you can see I highlighted previously triglycerides, so you can see that um, this group is uh, uh, of um, triglycerides are clustered together here, and so are uh, cardiolipins and uh, phosphatidylethanolamines and other different classes of lipids. In color here, colors here represent uh, um, differential um, uh, abundance of these lipids. And um, 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 people who progress to have um, advanced um, and, um, kidney uh, stage kidney disease, as opposed to those who um, uh, remain stable over the course of years. 
And so uh, this um, type of um, uh, networks allows us to sort of, you know, generate some uh, uh, biochemical context for these findings. Now, um, to um, uh, go to the next step with uh, this partial correlation and based network analysis, this is really um, um, conceptualization that George came up with. And so if you think about it, uh, uh, so I talked a little bit about the importance of having the number of uh, samples relative to the number of metabolites. But uh, so far, we talked about building network, uh, single network um, uh, for uh, two conditions. That's what was done in the examples that I showed you. However, uh, again, in uh, an example like this, uh, we had two groups of uh, patients. And what we, did, what we really wanted to do, we really wanted to build differential networks. Now, in principle, there is nothing to stop us from building, uh, applying DSPC and building networks separately for each condition. However, uh, that would mean that uh, we would further divide our sample size in half. And um, again, uh, to address this issue, we came up with the um, with a, a different algorithms that we call differential network based enrichment analysis or DNA, and uh, develop a, a tool uh, that is called filigree that I'm going to talk about next. All right. So uh, this, as I said, this has been published. So um, uh, Guy T. Iron, her uh, lightning talk um, on. Uh, Tuesday um, briefly talk, uh, talked about this, and uh, so um, she, in her work, she um, developed several uh, sort of additions and improvements to this algorithm, but the principle is that we uh, perform a joint network estimation, uh, and then uh, the next step, we uh, cluster the net, net identify from consensus clustering, I should say, to identify st stable subnetwork modules. And then the stable subnetworks are tested for enrichment. Now, uh, in a uh, real life application of this, uh, there are several important things to be aware of. Uh, one is that uh, we often have um, um, the experimental groups of, of uneven sample size. And this is something that we need to take into consideration. And uh, the other issue is that, uh, for example, lipidomics data sets in um, uh, shotgun lipidomics can um, uh, basically can measure um, in human plasma up to 800 or more um, lipids, uh, in, in different lipid species. And so uh, what we wanted to be able to uh, do, we wanted to, uh, they are going to uh, allow us if we Choose, so choose to um, collapse uh, some of the individual single metabolites into a singular feature. And that was implemented in, in this um, um, version of the uh, algorithm and in this tool. So Filigree is a user-friendly tool uh, implemented in uh, Java. This is the interface. And uh, so I have to give credit again to Bill Duran and, and Jen Wigginton for the uh, for the developers um, behind this tool and implemented it beautifully. And so the scope of application is filigree is um, you can use it to analyze targeted, untargeted metabolomics data and importantly lipidomics data. And so the objectives are, are really to identify highly interconnected metabolic modules. Uh, and um, uh, um, derive uh, mechanistic insights from the data, and also um, to be able to test uh, this metabolic module association with um, phen phenotypes of interest uh, with different phenotypic outcomes. And next, I'm going to show you a few examples of um, uh, how uh, we applied uh, filigree and this algorithm. Okay, so if you're going to test a tool, well, uh, first you better be able to recapitulate some of the known findings um, and uh, show that you can uh, find what other people have uh, found before. So this particular data set, we downloaded it from Metabolomics Workbench, but uh, the data was at UC Davis. And so this is a uh, mouse model of type 1 diabetes. Uh, as you can see, we had a relatively um, small number of samples here. 
And um, so here we're focused on a, a subset of data that involved 163 uh, primary metabolites. They were adjusted for gender and age. And so um, uh, the filigree analysis um, helped us uh, generate these uh, networks, what I'm showing you here. Uh, um, two networks laid, laid out side by side, non-diabetic uh, non uh, versus uh, type 1 diabetic mice. And one thing that perhaps is the most tr striking from these networks, you see that um, the non-diabetic non mice, it appears to be um, uh, uh, hi highly interconnected, whereas uh, in type 1 diabetes, it's basically you know, almost completely disjoint. And uh, so we uh, tested that result and you know tried different parameters. Always came to the same conclusion, and so uh, that that is something that really kind of you know jumps uh, at you this uh, sort of you know dysregulation of this network here. Now the program also generates and um, as I said this um, kind of highly interconnected modules, uh, and so this is shown here. Uh, they have. Uh, P value, um, adjusted p values that is a significance value that is associated with enrichment of these subnetworks. And I didn't talk much about the enrichment, but enrichment here takes into consideration differential uh, abundance of metabolites, but and also uh, the differential network uh, topology. And so if you notice the legend here, uh, the um, uh, edges are three different color edges. They're almost you know, there are very, very few blue edges, which are equally likely to be present in each condition. And uh, the, uh, then there are differential edges, the blue edges predominantly present in non-diabetic group and red edges predominantly present in diabetic group. I'm going over that because this is sort of, you know, the convention that um, we kind of, you know, try to follow. Uh, I, I try to follow through other examples as well. And so uh, with, sort of, you know, small exception of uh, one most significant subnetwork here, um, as one, um, uh, um, there is like de uh, strong deregulation of the network throughout um, the rest of, uh, of the network here. And so I can tell you that the metabolites in this subnetwork are all related to uh, oxidative stress. Uh, which is a known hallmark of type 1 diabetes. Also, um, I want to say that um, we, um, so uh, the data set, Teddy data set that was mentioned several times throughout the last couple of days, um, is a large uh, type 1 diabetes uh, data set in children. Um, uh, we are downloaded that data set for metabolomics uh, workbench and we're using it um, out of. In, uh, in just a few minutes about uh, our work in uh, developing filigree R package. And so we're using type one uh, TD data set to um, test this and um, sort of validate, uh, do some sensitivity analysis. And uh, I have to say that we observed a uh, very similar network uh, dysregulation in TD data set. Just wanted to comment on that. The second example involves the uh, again, another well-known uh, study it comes from Framingham uh, Heart Study of Spring Cohort, and in this instance, uh, uh, I think many of you are familiar with it, probably. Uh, so initially, um, the uh, all the participants were healthy, and uh, then uh, uh, approximately hundred uh, individuals developed type two diabetes over the subse subsequent examination. Uh, uh, cycles. So a um, couple of things are very striking here. Um, uh, main being that the uh, groups are very uneven, which I sort of you know mentioned earlier. So in this instance, uh, we uh, were able to take advantage to the um, code that Gaidri has developed uh, to, that allows us to subsample the uh, mm, or, uh, uh, to do subsampling to um, account for the uneven uh, sample size. And so here I'm showing uh, an overview of the partial correlation network uh, derived from this type uh, 2 diabetes data. And so lipid, lipid compounds and uh, polar metabolites are clustered into two distinct uh, uh, subnetwork groups. And uh, once we have applied the clustering, we obtain uh, um, um, uh, six uh, significant subnetworks shown here, 
And uh, so again, uh, I think they allow us to recapitulate some of the findings, uh, uh, although, uh, uh, not, although not all of them were uh, apparent in this cohort. Uh, but um, one can sort of, you know, follow this and examine the individual uh, cohorts. Again, this um, part of it is from our uh, recent uh, publication of filigree uh, that I've mentioned here. And I really want to draw your attention to example number three, because here we're doing something slightly different. In this case, data comes from uh, the um, Michigan mother infant uh, pairs cohort. Uh, and uh, so the lipidomics data were generated um, at, our, at our metabolomics um, uh, data here. Uh, so there were from uh, maternal uh, blood at the first trimester and at the third trimester of pregnancy and infant, infant cord blood uh, um, at the um, at, at time of delivery. And so uh, that's the lipidomics data that we are uh, analyzing here. Shotgun lipidomics analysis was performed. And so here we have applied uh, filigree and we did pairwise analysis. So um, in principle, uh, the algorithm can be used to analyze to do the perform the analysis across um, um, more than two groups, but uh, we didn't do it here. And George, in his lightning talk yesterday, um, presented his uh, um, new development of a different uh, uh, methodological approach for analyzing uh, multiple groups. Uh, so, um, but uh, here, once we have identified uh, the uh, the subnetworks or metabolic modules in uh, uh, from, derived from the data. Uh, at the next step, uh, what we did here, uh, we performed group loss or regression to select subnetworks uh, that were associated with infant birth weight, which was uh, sort of the objective of the study. Uh, we wanted to examine the influences um, of the um, uh, maternal lipids on the infant birth uh, weight. And so this is from the previous paper by uh, Chad Grant and, uh, Jen, uh, and Jen Mayo. Uh, so this is just a heat map uh, describing this data. So it is organized by lipid classes and uh, each panel here represents first trimester, third trimester and cord blood. As you can see, for example, uh, lysophospholipids are uh, um, abundant in at the first trimester and they're depleted in the third trimester and uh, they are present at <laughs> relatively high level in, in uh, the infant cord blood. Now, uh, uh, moving on with this analysis uh, from uh, our um, uh, group loss regression, we were able to identify two subnetworks um, that show stronger association with birth, birth weight uh, and cord blood. And uh, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, one of them contained uh, the phospholipids that I just pointed out to you in the heat map. And uh, so uh, in contrast, triglycer uh, uh, triglycerides, primarily triglyceride subnetwork, show stronger association uh, with birth weight in maternal uh, blood. I should have mentioned, and I should have explained that why this subnetwork looks so different. So uh, this sort of, you know, represents this collapsed nodes where we were able to um, group this, um, you know, in this case, uh, lysophospholipids into a singular node uh, because they were strongly correlated. And this is a feature of the program that it allows you to select the level of, um, uh, for the node collapsing. So uh, this um, uh, project is uh, ongoing. Uh, we have parallel data sets, uh, untargeted data sets that were generated uh, um, at, uh, by, by the metabolic score here. And so uh, untargeted data, uh, data uh, there are two subsets of data that were generated in 2016 and 2019. And so here we're trying to kind of, you know, take advantage of uh, different tools. Honey Hubbard presented uh, the, uh, talked about his tool Metab Combiner uh, in the context of unknown lipids and also of unknown lipids. And here, uh, Honey applied this uh, to uh, align these individual data sets uh, and uh, then next we performed the differential analysis and constructed partial correlation networks. These are partial correlation networks from the untargeted data. And uh, so uh, basically, uh, I mean, it follows the convention that I just showed you. We're comparing uh, uh, 
third trimester first trimester and cord blood versus uh, third trimester of pregnancy. And so you can see the changes in uh, different classes of lipids um, in primary metabolites and um, bile acids, fatty acids, and so on and so forth. And so uh, basically, um, uh, these networks allow you to do some uh, reasoning and um, uh, look at uh, and begin to look and understand the biochemistry. And my uh, final example uh, comes from um, um, a study of ALS, as you know. Uh, it is a devastating disease that has no cure. And so um, in our recent paper published in Brain, uh, we uh, also uh, looked at um, uh, data from two cohorts. And uh, so the samples are very precious. So this is the largest uh, metabolomic study in ALS to date. Uh, so cohort one uh, was uh, analyzed in 2018 and cohort two in 2019. And so this is basically, you know, these two volcano plots are just looking at reproducibility of the data across two cohorts. Um, so the dark green dots here represent metabolite reproducible. And so the most significant fi finding uh, in these two cohorts uh, were um, quite consistent. And so this is the overall um, workflow of the study uh, for uh, both cohorts one and two, uh, performed a number of uh, different tests uh, to identify significant metabolites uh, from these different models and uh, compare the overlaps in metabolites, which I, uh, I kind of alluded to here, and also to uh, look use enrichment anal traditional enrichment analysis to look at the pathway overlap. And uh, I think I'm showing that next here. So uh, what you can uh, glean from this very quickly is that uh, metabolomics uh, data was uh, concord, particularly concordant with respect to lip various lipid subpathways here, right? So, and this one here on this. Uh, and uh, so uh, next, um, but the real question we want to do, uh, answer is, can we uh, merge these two cohorts and can we take advantage of increased sample size to be able to apply our partial correlation network analysis? And so uh, this is the work that Hanya actually did uh, by um, combining uh, the, these data sets, which is shown here in PCA plots, quite consistent. And so this is an overview of uh, two of significant, the most significant, uh, not the most, but two of the significant subnetworks, most interesting, I should say, subnetworks that were obtained with this analysis. Fingam Islands has been implicated in um, ALS previously. And so uh, you can see that the algorithm quite successfully um, groups related lipids. And uh, so in the second net, uh, subnetwork, there's a number of different phospholipids that are colored by class here, according to this legend. And so I think the other thing that I kind of want to stress here, you can see that while I'm talking about uh, the, the driven analysis, I really, uh, you know, try to emphasize uh, bringing in the information about chemical classes and uh, prior information about pathways here. Okay, and uh, this proved to be quite valuable in this analysis. So, uh, in summary, I would like to say that uh, data-driven networks uh, really uh, allow to probe deeper into the data and they provide a viable alternative to a traditional pathway analysis. And so this can really be used for the analysis of epidemics data and untargeted data. And the sort of, you know, brief, brief footnote here is that unknown compounds can certainly be included in the analysis and we have done that on many occasions, but it is very important to uh, manage uh, the um, annotations and uh, take care of uh, the uh, data redundancies and re really uh, perform data reduction very carefully in order for this to be successful, because the correlation based methods are likely to uh, identify addicts and fragments and other degeneracies in the data that have been missed perhaps by the annotation software. And then I cannot emphasize enough the need to incorporate prior knowledge into this analysis. And um, so uh, I would like to, my concluding slide is basically, um, uh, uh, so this is sort of, you know, current state of events. 
and uh, uh, some work in progress. So uh, I described a couple of different tools to you um, and a couple of different algorithms that uh, these are both user-friendly Java tools, which are su suitable for new users, beginners. Um, we're currently working on the R filigree R package. This is the workflow that will combine the workflows, these tools into one uh, R package. And uh, so it implements a faster version of GWAS algorithm. And it is parallel, it will be parallelized and streamlined. And uh, I think we'll be able to keep up with the larger data sets. And uh, perhaps will be much, much more suitable for um, expert users, those who are familiar with R. And uh, in both cases, uh, data can be visualized in Netscape and variety of different programs. The output is just basically a file of nodes and edges. Uh, that contains information that can be uh, imported in, into any data uh, visualization tool. And uh, we're currently working on extrapolating some of these methods into multi-omics integration, which Gayatri I talked about in her lightning talk on the first day. And uh, so uh, I would really like to conclude by acknowledging all the people who worked on this project and who contributed to this project. Um, uh, so uh, George and myself are the PIs. Uh, uh, Chuck Grant is our uh, uh, co-investigator and invaluable uh, collaborator on this. Uh, this is the team um, I've mentioned uh, um, uh, some names throughout the project. Others have contributed greatly, and um, you know past uh, contributions from uh, uh, people who were uh, working with George at the time, his students, uh, and uh, um, uh, the uh, MRC uh, to metabolomic score. And last but not least, I would like to acknowledge the um, finding for the project uh, that comes really from uh, both the D or DTC project and from the CIDC project, because uh, Metab Combiner software was funded by that. And I'll stop there. And if I have any time left, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ala. Uh, 